Hey, what's up? Welcome, everybody. My name is Dela, and I am your host and showrunner for the Trek Table. I just wanted to come and let you all know as I sit here with Grudge, we're in some holidays times here, and we're celebrating winter holidays. The Trek Table team definitely wanted to bring some fun, uh, new content to talk about this new Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 6, Stormy Weather episode. But we also wanted to give our BiWalk team and our allies a little bit of time off on the holidays to spend some time with self, family, and friends, and maybe just catch up and hanging out, lounging around. So we want to support all the things. We're so happy that you joined us today um, here for our special holidays episodes. There might be some fun friends in the chat, and we're so excited to bring you this content even while folks are having an opportunity to spend some holiday time with self, with family, and with friends. We're so happy that you joined us here at the Trek Table, and we hope you'll join us on Sunday, January 2nd, for our second and final installment of our 2021 holidays episodes. Uh, have a great rest of your week, and we're going to keep holding Trek space for you. See you soon. <laughs> Welcome to Trek Table, your live stream ritual. Holding Trek space for Black, Indigenous, Brown, women of color, queer or otherwise, and our allies. Hello, and I am your host, Dela, and today I'm holding Trek space for all the feelings that are in space and that feeling different is good and special. Oh, I'm your co-host, Claudia, and today I am holding Trek space for family and all of the drama and trauma comes with. Hi, I'm your co-host, Maya, and I'm holding Trek space for coming together in all the ways that we can and vaccines and masks. Hi, I'm your co-host Maya Mama, and I'm holding Trek Space for celebration. It's a celebration. <laughs> All right, and we want to welcome everybody to this Trek Table. And we always start uh, with acknowledging that, that our teams for the Trek Table are on the unceded land of the Tongva, the Chumash, Kish, Olone, Puyallup, Pawtucket, and Massachusetts peoples. We are grateful to the indigenous stewards of these lands, the ancestors who have come before, those who are here now, and those who have yet to come. We invite our listeners and our viewers to also be an acknowledgement and connection to the lands that you are on. Invite everybody to go ahead and take a breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us today for this special um, episode as we hold Trek space for women of color here at our very first Trek table, the holidays edition. Some might call it Trek table light, maybe Trek table unprepped. We'll see. But we've assembled our beautiful Trek table crew here um, earlier in this week before this broadcast so that we could dig into this really chunky and important discovery episode. Um, and so we're so excited to welcome our digital audiences on Outside In Theater's YouTube channel. And of course, for those of you listening on our podcast, we want to thank you so much. And I want to say thanks to the Shrek Table team for helping us keep our content flowing as we explore season four. Our opening track is titled Chicana Skies by the band Quetzal off their album Quetzal. You'll be hearing several tracks by Quetzal throughout this episode of Trek Table. Follow them at Cats All Music on Instagram. And welcome back to today's Trek Table episode number 38. We're discussing Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 6, Stormy Weather. And while this is a little bit of unprepped, we're still super excited to share with you our fresh conversations with each other as we dive into this episode a few ways. We're going to have some Trek Table questions from Claudia. We're going to play a little bit of popcorn disco recap. Maya's here. Maya Mama's here with some Discovery design. I'm going to braid it all together in thematics. We're going to chunk into the arcs of Captain Burnham, Book, and Zora this week. Week. We've got some Star Trek shenanigans, of course, signal boosts, final thoughts, and gratitude. 
We are so excited for everybody to join us today. Um, we want to continue this practice. And um, before we jump into our discussion, we usually like to make sure we go around the table and see who's here. So I want to invite our um, table assembled to go ahead and check in. Can I have you share your name, your pronouns, your visual description, access check-in, and how you identify as a Star Trek fan? Uh, Maya Mama, can I ask you to go first? I am Maya Mama. I use she, her pronouns. I am a youngish looking middle-aged black woman. I am wearing a my blue disco t-shirt, um, some blue makeup, red lipstick. I have a big red afro and I have a headband that is holding my Star Trek insignia. Um, I come from a generational Star Trek family and I identify as Omni Sci-Fi. Ooh, get it, Omni Sci-Fi. All right, I'll go next. Uh, what's up, everybody? I'm Dela. My pronouns are she, he, they, and Dela. Um, my visual check-in is I'm a mixed race Philippine X person sitting in front of um sitting in Captain Burnham's ready room. Grudge is kind of around behind me to the back. Um, and my nose is a little bit red today because my access check-in is, I think I got a little bit of the flu, uh, a little cold. I'm hoping it's cold. Um, so I might sniffle and sneeze a little during the show. I'm going to try to keep everybody cool. But I have my um, holding a grudge mug uh, filled with some chamomile <laughs> tea today <laughs> because I'm not just sci-fi uh, Holly, but I am Star Trek Discovery Primary. If that means anything to you, I'm glad. Um, that's my day. Claudia, can I invite you to check in? Uh, Claudia, gender pronouns, they, their. You can use she, her, though. Uh, visual description, African-American woman with a big brown afro, wearing headphones. I've got my Star Trek loving shirt that has, like, rainbow stripes on it. Um, um, you, you might be able to see the massive amount of ice packs I have strapped to my body because I am here for this show. I just had to get prepared with my disabled body, but I'm here for it. Very excited. Um, if you see me pull a face, it is because uh, my muscles are pulling me. I'm not, I'm not making, I'm not having a bad opinion about Star Trek. Other than that, all of my uh, access needs are met because I also have my tea, girl, Earl Grey hot um, in my big Star Trek mug. And I identify as generational Star Trek lover and I'm a poly sci-fi fantasy lover. So I, I watch a lot of things. Awesome. Welcome, Claudia. And Maya, can I invite you to check in? Yes, hello. Um, I am Maya, she, her, hers, and I'm a Latinx Guatemalan mestiza. I have, um, I don't know what color, it's some, like a magenta, maybe lipstick, maybe it matches my magenta glasses and my magenta hair. Um, and um, I, am, I am wearing a Trek... Picard themed um, holiday t-shirt and these are my friends from season one discovery the background with holiday sweaters um Burnham is wearing it looks like a unicorn and um <laughs> and Lorca is there with his Hanukkah t-shirt um <laughs> so and unfortunately Saru's head he's very tall so he's not in we can see his body but not much else um, I, my access check-in, I am, you know, sometimes I have some auditory processing things happening, um, but, you know, it usually makes for f good fun. Um, I am sort of in comparison to everybody else on this, uh, table, I am the newer of the, the Star Trek, uh, Star Trekians, but I, today I identify as a courier Trek. <laughs> okay, courier check. All right. Well, I welcome everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, audience uh, watching us in this um, in our first live uh, share of this video, we invite you to check in as well. We'd love to see who's watching. Um, and before we jump into our conversation tonight, we do one final bit of business, which is our Trek table agreements. We want to welcome all who enter, whether you are a newbie or you were raised in a Star Trekking family. Welcome and let's build this space together. Whether you use Trek Table as your nerdy exploration or as part of your self-care ritual, Trek Table is a weekly space to put down the world for a second and come into Trek space. This is a space for Black, Brown, Indigenous women of color to be a fan, a geek, a nerd, and explore the vastness of the Star Trek multiverse. 
Yes, and the truck table is also a place for allies to come and engage and explore as well. This is an opportunity for allies to hold space and focus on the insights, perspectives, and experiences that we or you may not be familiar with. And now that we are all here, we remind you that we seek to build an environment of mutual respect and listening. We understand that we'll, we'll disagree, and that's actually part of the fun, but there's enough violence going on out there in the world. So let's keep our phasers on stun. Great. So let's go ahead and take a breath and let's breathe in all those agreements. Go ahead and breathe in. And exhale. Thank you. And that brings us to our first question of the show. We got some exciting questions today. First one is, if you were a ship that was singing to raise spirits, what song would you sing? Welcome back. We're here with Trek Table question number one. If you were a ship singing to, to singing to raise spirits, what song would you sing? Now, of course, in the show, we see that Zora is singing just to Michael. Like, is that a, is that a song that Zora likes? Is that a song that Zora thinks Michael would like? I'm not sure. But let's just put your put your put your head in the space of Zora. What song would you sing to help Michael feel better? Um, let's start with, uh, Maya Mama. Maya Mama, what song would you be singing? I would, uh, sing On the Wings of Love by Jeffrey Osborne. You know that song? <laughs> On the Wings of Love. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. Up in the oh, above. Da, 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 da. That's a good place to stop. Let's, that's, that's a really great good. song. That's really, that's, really that's, good. Yeah, okay, that's, that's amazing. Happen, that's amazing. But, yeah, that's um, amazing. I did not realize that asking this question would invite us all to sing. I think that's going to happen now, and I'm not mad at that. I am not mad at that result. Um, I also didn't realize the question I wrote was such a tongue twister because it has so many S's in it. Um, Maya, what song would you sing to raise spirits on the Discovery? You know, a Storm and Weather is really one of my, like, songs that I do sing to myself um, since I was, like, in high school. But um, I would choose... Um, Shadows of the Night, uh, Pat Benatar, you know, we're running with the shadows of the night. Oh, oh baby, cool. take my hand yeah. and I'll be all right. Uh, I, 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 I love it. I love it. I'm just thinking like, like, <laughs> like, like you're a ship, right? Like Zora was singing a cappella. Like Zora didn't, mm -hmm. like Zora could have. Zora could have like added some strings or some like backing. But Zora was just like, just the mm -hmm. sounds of my voice, baby. So I like this. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of that song where it's just the voice, just your voice. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. That's so awesome. Um, and Maya, I also love Stormy Weather. It was the first song that was taught to me. I, I got vo vocal lessons from a blind um, a vocal musician um, mm -hmm. I, when I was in high school. And that was the song he taught me. So that's the first song. I learned to sing and it was chosen for me because it was like that's Alina's that's Lena Horn. That's a song black people would mm. like. I bet you like that song. And I did. I did. <laughs> and I know it by heart, and I've been singing it a lot lately. Dela, what song would you sing if you were gonna sing um a song to, to raise spirits? I'm thinking maybe mama said knock you out. Like a mama said knock you out. Mm. I'm gonna knock Maybe, maybe not that actually. <laughs> what, 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 what would you say? <laughs> I think there's a couple of songs that come to mind, but the one lately that I'm really trying to perfect is, is um, Patty Labelle singing uh, and Michael McDonald singing on my own. On my own. Yeah. <laughs> And just, oh just the way, just the way that, 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 just the way you want to try to play those vocals. Um, I'm not yes. even, yeah. But like, but here's the thing, Dela, that's tricky. You just picked, you picked a duet. I like did. You're a computer. You can do both parts. You're a computer. You're a super computer. You can do it. I would it. sing with Zora. I would be <laughs> like, I'll do, I'll do the Michael McDonald or the Pat. <laughs> You know, um, I these are these are suggestions we're giving to the showrunners. These are just mm -hmm. loose ideas that they can mm -hmm. totally run with. Because I think that mm -hmm. maybe an entire episode where it's just karaoke, they're just jamming with the ship. That could be a lot of fun. Totally. And can I say one thing on that? 
Um, Claudia, you're totally right. And this feels like I want them to make an album. Um, Blue Skies, Issa Briones sang in Picard. And so now we get this actor who plays Zora singing Stormy Weather. So I don't want to say anything, but I just want to say, see you, Star Trek. I see what you're doing well, right now. All right. I'm, I'm taking us over time. I'm taking us over time. You do know that Data released an entire blues album. It's called Old mm -hmm. Yellow Eyes. So, so this is not unprecedented. I'm excited about these ideas that we've cooked up. And Good. that was question number one. Trick table, question number one. <laughs> Trick Table is proud to be a part of the digital theater platform at Outside In Theater. Like and subscribe to the Outside In YouTube channel for our weekly live digital recordings. Listening on the podcast? Check out youtube.com slash Outside In Theater. Welcome back. I'm so excited. All right. So with that song, Matanzas, uh, by the band Quetzal, we know that it is time for Popcorn Recap. But because it is our holiday show, we're going to try it a little bit of different. Um, and we're going to give each member of our table an opportunity to go around and share what they uh, their take on this episode. So we're, we're talking about Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 6, Stormy Weather, written by Anne Kofel Saunders and Brandon Schultz, and directed by my boy. Jonathan Frakes. Yes, yes. And the logline from um, the show says, Seeking Answers, the USS Discovery ventures into a subspace rift created by the dark matter anomaly. Meanwhile, Book faces a strange visitor from his past. Okay, so that's what the show tells us this, the episode is about. Um, but now we want to go around and give each of us a minute to share our own personal highlights or maybe plots that you were resonating with this week. Um, all right, so my mama, can I ask you to go first? Okay. Incoming transmission. So I really like sort of the classic episodic feel of this episode because usually because we've been doing a lot of like long story arcs. Um and I love me some Johnny Frakes. Are we are we allowed to call him that? I don't know if we're allowed to call him that. Anyway, I think that like guilt seems to be a theme in this. Um uh and and Zora makes me nervous for lots and lots of reasons, but I I I like her. I've always kind of liked her. Um, uh, I, I love how smart Bryce is. He's so smart. He just, he's like, I know a fact. And uh, and the pattern Buffy, buffer was also really scary to me. I love that Owa was uh, uh, sharing personal stories so we can, we can learn more about her. And, and I think it's beautiful how um, Saru was honoring the tale. And I love that book and Michelle or book and Michelle book and Michael love each other. And that they, uh, even though they don't agree um, and a ship having a panic attack. That's it. <laughs> awesome. Maya mama next. Can I invite Maya your minute to tell us your highlights or personal plot joys from this week's episode? incoming transmission okay yeah i mean you know i star trek has felt very much like space mystery but this week it felt more like space thriller and it was a little bit difficult for me to watch alone i think it just the being kind of stuck inside the ship all the um, unknowns, the the kind of the silences, this sentient organism, li uh, you know, that lives in a supercomputer makes me feel a little bit, you know, 2001 film worried that the computer is going to kill people. Um, it's scary to have to depend on a computer that has feelings and is making their own decisions, um, you know, scary computer behavior. But um, also Book's dad is super hard on him in his subconscious and you know that was also like a thing i was thinking a lot about too uh the when you know hallucinating and and um what what kinds of things the negative things that that you carry with you from your fans incoming transmission 
Okay, I have lots of thoughts and feelings about this episode. I'm going to speak a little fast. I am super in love with this idea of deductive reasoning and scientific reasoning as a way to manage feelings. I'm seeing uh, Burnham's Vulcan training come into to play here. I'm also really resonating with the ways in which uh, Gray, as the AI um, body with his own spirit, is the connector to uh, Zora as the computer. I love all of the Zora drops that we've seen in the title sequence that we never even knew was Zora. Um, I love that Detmer does math. And like, just kind of does the look away and like calculates all these things. Like science is cool. I loved all the teamwork on this episode. What's up, Dr. Pollard? You are back. I was so happy to see you. Um, I love all the quotes in this episode. I want to write a poem from these quotes. Um, mm. And I just want to say like, the shenanigans of having Discovery survive this episode so that we get to see it in the Archer space dock is super dope. And yes, I feel so, there's so many things in this episode, but those were some of my favorite ones. And finally, Claudia, can you share your minute highlights, personal plot points you found fun, um, any insights? Incoming transmission. It's the nothing from the never ending story. It's the nothing. No. Oh, okay. God. Okay. <laughs> it's actually very polite to say please. You should be saying please all the time. Saru being freaked out a little bit about the sentient Zora is super funny. Saru nonplussed. Hilarious. Look at Stamets learning to say thank you. I appreciate your presence, book. Look at him growing. Mm -hmm. Um, um, greater focus leads to greater awareness. Like mixing the spiritual and scientific. I am here for it. Like, what happens when a spaceship meditates? What happens? The bridge crew really needs Saru's leadership. They were freaking out. They were like, let's bring brainstorm ourselves to death and through was like no how about we just do our jobs okay therapy for spaceships i'm here for it reminded me of when the doctor on voyager had a nervous breakdown and janeway helped him move forward through it because erasing the memory would not help so i'm like oh yes this is like with a spaceship teaching us healthy things galactic barrier what is this galactic barrier i only remember this being a thing in the old original star trek and i don't feel like it was a thing for next generation or any of the others i need more details i have more stuff <laughs> If you're having a good time, let's keep the dialogue going. Like and follow us on Instagram at Trek Table and on Twitter at Trek underscore Table. Welcome, welcome to Discovery Design. We've seen some beautiful and amazing design elements in this episode of Disco, and my mama needs to know what the panel thinks about them. So let's dish. Dela, let's start with you. With your love of minutia, can you share an element that just made you do like just mental deep diving and thinking? Yes, I realized I brought it up in my summary, but yeah, uh, the Zora as a ship surviving and then going into space dock was super fascinating to me. And just all the times I've ever seen the Enterprise burn or hurl itself towards a planet, crash land. I mean, we had it in the icy planet for Discovery in season three, and now we're getting the first rebuild of season four with programmable matter at the Archer space dock. So I'm here for all of that. Well, yeah, and you know, she even said, like, I feel part of me dying, which is very mm -hmm. disturbing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, that family tree uh, from the last episode, it was pretty prominent in this episode. And Michael and Zora both shared family trees. Um, mm -hmm. I just thought that they were really beautiful. What, what, what are your thoughts on the tree? I also did. Oh, I think the tree's gorgeous. I loved um, seeing Michael's family tree. I will say I was a little, I know the way the shots panned. I was like, ha ha, there's no Amanda Grayson, but I oh, love no, Amanda. Amanda was in it. You saw Amanda her? Okay. I only saw Sarek. I didn't see Amanda. So maybe I just didn't see her, but I, yeah, I did. I fully froze the screen and looked at every <laughs> single tree because I wanted to see Cybok. I was like, is Cybok on that tree? Is there a Cybok? There's not a Cybok. Mm. I looked four times. Amanda was on there. Okay. Okay. How did you feel about that tree, Claudia? I feel like you have feelings about these trees. <laughs> I did. But I was. Really just, I was trying to. I was trying to see if it was giving me plot clues. Mm. So I was. I would really wanted to see what Michael's tree had on it. Because if Cybok was on that tree, that would tell me some things. If for all of our viewers who haven't seen Star Trek Five. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And all right. I, wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. That was a lot. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you both of you. But um, Claudia, so we were um, locked in the ship pretty much for the entire episode. Um, were there any spots on the ship that just, you know, just looked really great to you? Well, you know, I feel like several of us have named that the um, casual dining, relaxing spaces, they seem really beautifully designed. They feel like inviting spaces that you'd want to hang out. And this one, if you, again, if you freeze the screen, Dela is the one that turned me on to this one. You freeze the screen, you can see a Ferengi is running the bar. There's a Ferengi right running the, the bar. Corner. Mm-hmm. So you know you've got I, I you know you've got it's the future they're relaxing playing chess as you do that's what we always are doing we're always relaxing playing chess at the bar and um um I like that thought. <laughs> that felt like a real relaxing thing you know I've always thought like w- I have never done that no I <laughs> I have now there is like there's a a bar in Seattle that you can play board games at. But like mm. that's like as specific activity. I have never like been like, hey, you guys want to go down to the old watering hole and play a few games mm-hmm. of yeah. chess, um, <laughs> Jenga maybe. Ooh. It's a little Jenga, um, dirty Jenga. Now, um, <laughs> Claudia, what about Zora's face? Um, okay, so so I have some questions about this. First of all, mm-hmm. why why she even got a fix? Like, why'd she even do that? Mm-hmm. Like, why did she feel like she had to manifest herself visually? Because Bryce, I think it's Bryce reacts. She's just like, oh, that's what you look like? And she's like, yes, that is what I look like. Beep, beep, bop. Um, it's cool because it's it was a teaser. So there was an image in the opening credits. It was like, what is that? Why is that? Now we know. That's what Zora chose to look like. And if you've seen the short trek, there's a short trek. Starring mm-hmm. the very, very, very handsome and good actor Aldous Hodges, yes, and he, I like to be accurate and state facts. And mm-hmm. he was on that ship with Zora, but somehow in the future, and um, they were like falling in love, and she was like deciding to look like a full human. So I am curious about like how, like, is she gonna like make more things? I'm, I'm fascinated because it's a very rudimentary circle thing she's doing right now. That's mm-hmm. my opinions on Zora's face. Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of like, you know, um, nowadays, uh, when we see a lot of people, um, and everyone always has a mask on and a mask on. And then, and then when they take the mask off and you're kind of like, Oh, is that what your face looks like? I mean, and it's not in a rude way. It's just like, Oh, I wasn't expecting. I just didn't know. (laughs) That's what you look like. Uh, (laughs) well, thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much. Uh, Maya, I would like to finish with the best name. Uh, so. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. Thank you. <laughs> Don't mention it, Maya. Uh, so <laughs> could you share your thoughts on this void, the the nothing, this silence? Uh, just there were a lot of different uh combinations of elements with that i was thinking a lot about the sound and and the lack of sound i didn't know that space is loud when i have done a little bit of you know um video editing and and tried to recreate space i did think i usually thinking about spaceship sound so yes when when they talk about that that moment and then there's just like this quiet nothingness so eerie to me so creepy um the silence because I'm just waiting for something to jump out of the out of the nothing out of the void and you know that they're they're um nothing's being registered but then also yeah the quiet and the unknowing can be almost scarier than than a monster right like even when commercials for example they're super loud um, they're they're not really turned up loud. The the sound is actually compressed in a different way. Um, it can kind of make you jump, but then also just being quiet or like moments of quiet. Uh, you know, it can totally kind of shift your feelings. So it just felt like a pressure cooker of a ship in isolation. Super scary. Well, um, and especially that dot. That dot that we were reading. We had and I was like, is the dot and then a robot scream? <laughs> is the dot connected to Zora? Because isn't that how we first heard yes. Zora's voice was through mm-hmm. a dot? 
So, Mm -hmm. you know, that little scream. Oh, yeah, that was that was super. And it was it was like a silent scream, too. Right. And Mm -hmm. she's like, oh, turn off the screen. Yeah. Everybody had to go. No, that's enough of that. Um, Now we have. um, Now, we 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 did in the track table, we asked like what question that we wanted to hear but what did you think about just i know that you love the song stormy weather um with the ship being all in flame and um michael being in her mask in the song um any thoughts about uh, uh, just about the look and i guess the whole picture of it yeah you know it made me think of like um you know, classical music, when they juxtapose that with something, you know, violent happening, it like kind of like in, in, um, Godfather, um, you know, that's, I feel like that's a thing, but this is like this jazz song that is so, you know, it's been sung by Billie Holiday, my super favorite, and as well as Ella, um, Ella Fitzgerald, you also mentioned Lena Horne, and, you know, and they all sing it totally different, and I just was listening to every kind of note that she was singing it, and that, and that, you know, and then Michael Burnham's just like, I'm giving you, you're going to take care of the crew for me, right? So, very emotional, and, and the, and the, the bluesiness, jazzness of that, of that song, um, juxtaposed with, yeah, going up in flames and and again not really hearing the flames only hearing the song yes yes really Mm -hmm. really beautiful well thank you so much for sharing that thank you maya and uh that is discovery design we want to give a shout out to all of our podcast subscribers thanks so much for joining us thanks for following us on apple google libsyn spotify and wherever you find your podcast don't forget to like and subscribe Welcome back with Trek Table question number two. Now, I don't know if y'all have noticed this, but have you noticed that Star Trek captains have a thing with their ships? They they have a relationship with them. They they talk about their ships as if their ships are a person or sentient, right? They, they're loyal. They have loyalty to their ships. Like when the ship's going down, they're like, oh, I'll stay with the ship and everybody else can go. It is a thing. I have noticed in almost, I can't think, I tried to think of a Star Trek ship that had been gendered male. And I couldn't think of one. Even Janeway talked about her ship as if it was a woman. So first, my question is, why are all these starships gendered female? What is that about? Why? Why is that? And also, how is Michael's relationship different with her ship? Uh, Let me start with with, with you, Dayla, because you're you're another deep cut Star Trek nerd like me. So you've seen a a, a number of different uh, Star Treks. Um, Mm -hmm. Why are they all gendered female? What do you think? I mean, I feel like it goes back to what we've kind of talked about before. Gene Roddenberry was in the Navy and a lot of things. I mean, this is definitely a Navy nod episode with the sonar. But that that would be my guess is the way that hegemony works. And they just decided this is this would, would be what they would pick up. Um, I would love them to to tell us uh, that the ships are different genders. And, you know, I don't know. Even in Farscape. Isn't Farscape's ship a... a, a... Talon. Talon is Talon, Talon is, is a woman is a no Talon female. was the boy Talon, well, Talon was, was a boy, boy. Okay, Moya so Moya's son okay yeah. so you're right Talon was a boy so yep. sorry to go deep cut into another yeah uh, uh, sci-fi but like that's I, I'm just like yeah even in other even in other sci-fi worlds I feel like ships are always gendered female um and I just love the quote that Burnham says to Zora at the end of the episode she said it's different and different is good and special. And mm. she's happy that Zora is there. So I think, um, I don't know. Aww. Um, um I, I'm thinking about the Star Trek The Next Generation when the Enterprise had a baby. The Enterprise fully had a baby. We oh, had an entire episode where, right. you know, they were doing stuff with the with the holodeck and they made, an Enterprise made a baby and then birthed into space. And then for some reason, Star Trek never revisited that very large issue that they created. 
maybe maybe there's something that this show could do something about with that. Um, um, I'm wondering, Maya Mama, um, what is your take on, on this? Why are these ships gendered female? Um, well, maybe because ships keep you safe and protected and get you to where you need to be. And that's a, a generally a, a feminized trait. Um, um, but Michael's relationship with Zora is that Zora is a crew member, uh, not a tool, mm. not, uh, that, that, and, 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 um, you know, because she studied at the Vulcan Science Academy, she believes in infinite diversity and infinite creation. She's, so mm. she's, she's the right person to be around her. So, um, yeah, but I, I mean, I don't really know. I, I probably patriarchy is probably the thing. <laughs> right. I mean, I think you all have mostly touched on everything. Like uh, lots of things are personified female, like cars as well. Um, yeah, just lots of inanimate objects. It also makes me think of, I, I was just looked up a little bit, but noticed that it first there was a first appearance of like female gendering uh, a ship since the 1300s um in the english language so you know it goes pretty far back and i'm sure there's more history to that and and then just makes me think of you know i guess guys on a ship you know they they they're trying if whether (laughs) yeah the gendering of things and sometimes that are actually female and sometimes that aren't so um, whether they're objects or people or or what are those like little those whales or is it narwhals that, that mm-hmm. people used to think were were mermaids so mm-hmm. you know crazy things happen out there in space out there in the sea <laughs> i i think i'm going to uh, appreciate the answer of well you know patriarchy that feels like that could possibly be the response to so many of my truck table questions. Um, thank you for exploring these spaceships and why they're all gendered female. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. That was truck table question number two. And if you're as happy as we are that truck table is holding space for disco and other truck fans, then we invite you to share that joy with us and become a supporter on patreon.com slash truck table one-time donation, or monthly $1, $5, $10, whatever you've got to keep this work going. And now is that point in our unprepped episode when we have a Star Trek dance break! This is a Saru, Baby Spock. And welcome back to the thematic section of our Trek Table episode number 38. Today we are talking about Star Trek Discovery, season four, episode six, Stormy Weather. Uh, this is the segment where we like to braid it all together. And even in an unprepped holidays episode, we still want to dig into some of the themes in this show. And there are many, most certainly. Um, this first topic I want to bring up is just, um, we really get to see Burnham as captain, large and in charge. She is running it. Um, I think my favorite moment is when she kind of turns around she says what's up to everybody and then she's like red alert and she like walks back to her chair um we get some really beautiful moments with her and book um being able Mm. to um to be able to attend to each other in these amazing Mm. ways we get the the tree but we also get in this episode burnham not just as captain but the crew as crew we get to see all the commanders doing things um, we get to see Detmer, Awosakun, Bryce is back. Um, Nielsen is making contributions. So we're seeing a lot of things. Uh, I want to invite uh, us to reflect on this thematically, Burnham's journey as captain, the crew really, uh, I think, galvanizing in a really powerful way in this episode. Uh, Maya Mama, can I invite you to jump in here? Your thoughts about these dynamics, Burnham and this crew in this episode? Well, as always, they 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 always step up. They're they're not just a team. They're a family. 
and they rely on each other um, in um, in a in a really beautiful coexistence that uh, perhaps might be slightly um, uh, uh, codependent, but still uh, it it works for them. And uh, and you know I think this this is a lot about making the family love the ones you're with. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Claudia, your thoughts? Well, you know, I've been I rewatched Star Trek Five, and one of my takeaways from watching that was, wow, this is some sad people. Like it starts with them on, uh, you know, like on vacation, but they're on vacation with each other, and they're all gray. Like they have gray hair, and they're literally saying, "I have no other friends or family but you." That's why I have to vacation with you. I'm like, oh. Oh, that's not healthy. Here's the thing, though. That vibe, I love that vibe with the Discovery crew because they're in the future. It makes sense. I will say that I was feeling the bridge crew's presence more this episode. I liked that I felt them more just organically throughout the episode. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna name a thing that I've noticed where it seems like every single episode, one bridge crew person tells us a fact about themselves. And coincidentally, that fact helps to save the day. It's a good thing Bryce mm-hmm. knows about old school sonar. Cool. But we did also get a Wosakin giving us a factoid in her apology. So that felt slightly different, but I don't know. I, I preferred getting to know Gray better in this episode, where Gray was getting to be known in action. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Maya, your thoughts? Um, just I noticed that the uh, constant the constant um discussion of logic and emotions together and 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 the way that you know, I'm still sort of wrapping my head around um, the computer or uh, Zora as a sentient being, but um, but the way that Burnham's voice kind of drops in a in a certain very intense, like almost it's it's not it's not soft enough like a whisper, but it's just like Zora, listen to me, concentrate, right? And and it's very it's also soothing, kind of. But but helpful, right? She's not angry. She's not um, she's not patronizing. But she is, you know, talking her through. Like there's uncomfortable um, truths at, with with all these kinds of feelings coming up, and then and then talking her through what she's learned from her own battles with with logic and emotion um, as as a human, you know, raised Vulcan, and talking about walls and how those walls, putting those walls up over and over and freezing and and it just it was it was you know kind of odd to me that she's rationalizing with a computer but but the way she talks it was just I was like can can Burnham can you call me up can you leave me a couple messages mm-hmm. on my voicemail that I can mm-hmm. hear over and over mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yes and I would say yeah I found her speech super um helpful and it just I mean I, I wrote in my notes about this episode, like watching Burnham talk to Zora um, really just felt like what just the way in which I've seen wisdom shared among women of color, among women and the way in which like the way in which I know I have learned from black women about how to survive things and the way in which I honor that black women are constantly showing us in this country how to survive, how to make things better, how to make change, right? And so I just love that we get this moment where it's not only is Burnham the captain and she's rocking her thing and she's doing her due and her team is like stepping up and Saru is helping and, you know, like all the things are happening. But we also have this very real moment of like, and she's still the captain, so she's still going to get her captain moment in a Star Trek episode where she's got to be there for the ship and she's got to make sure the ship gets there and maybe she dies, you know? And she doesn't in this episode, um, but I just... So I see how those two moments connect in, in, in Discovery and it's another reason why I just continue to appreciate the show and love this show. Um, and I want to, I kind of want to expand this conversation because we're talking about Burnham and the crew. Um, but I also know this was a really big book episode. We're getting to see how Book is dealing with his ongoing process of healing from this grief um, and the way in which in this episode, we also get to see Stamets and Culber. Uh, we see the Stamets moment that Claudia, you were talking about in 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 recap. We're also seeing Stamets and Culber being the the husband witnesses to anybody to who seems to have a love who has died and their spirit is lingering and there's something really fascinating about that and 
Um, so I'm just really, yeah. And then we meet Book's dad. And is Book's dad really the spirit of his dad, or is Book, or is that the subconscious of Book's dad? So these are these these are the questions I want us to talk about. All right, um, Claudia, I'm going to come to you first. Thoughts on Book and this journey and where we are. I uh, book uh, Captain Riker and Tom Paris all need to go have some group therapy together to talk about their conflicted relationships with their fathers, and possibly Spock could join them. Yeah, yeah, bad um, dad and then, club. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, um, so yeah, it just, it just felt like they could, they would, they could have a really amazing conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to, um, switch order here and just jump to you, Maya. I'm wondering your thoughts about book and the empath empath and his journey. And then I'll come back to you, Maya. Mama. Well, yeah, what's, what's really powerful too, is this, the subconscious coming through and him, you know, clearly having struggle with, with, um, being kind of an insider outsider of the federation and his love for burnham and his trust for her but also you know the the little angry monsters that sometimes linger in your head and that that was brought out by his you know his accident but then what ends up happening is even through his hallucinations they tell him that his symptoms are actually the solution right so sometimes these these problems these challenges mm -hmm. these messes mm -hmm. these you know it, it, you know, dangers, you know, things, they, they are actually what lead us to more questions and, and, and some answers. Um, and that also he chooses to then embrace the madness to deal with the hallucinations and, and things have been rough. He's able to, you know, embrace, um, Burnham before everything goes down and, you know, and, and express that love, even though we know that he's actually starting to feel like, Hey, I'm, I need to do something about what happened. I'm, I am frustrated. And, um, I also have to just say that I love that grudge is, is still kind of, uh, not fully warm to Burnham and very protective mm -hmm. of book. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I just, I, because Burnham's like almost perfection now in her, in her captain's, um, position. And, and I love that, you know, like the cat is just like, what? Like, I don't have to respect you. I'm not, I'm not Starfleet. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I actually think that Star Trek is they're developing a grudge series or there's a new book or something. So I just want to say, look out for it. Grudge is going to get a lot more. I think there might be a grudge backstory property coming. So I just, wow. yeah, maybe I'm, maybe I'm also imagining that as the no, first no, space no, I, of Star Trek. I heard, was, I heard there was going to be a comic book series on the bridge crew. So I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't also some, some grudginess up in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Maya mama coming to you, your thoughts on book, this journey grudge. Well, I think that undirected rage can be really difficult. And right now book, uh, uh, doesn't have, uh, a, specific people to be angry at. They can't find them mm -hmm. because of this, um, a barrier um but i also think he's doing an amazing job at not projecting it on those around him mm -hmm. uh which could be which can be very difficult when you're dealing with uh that much grief and that much pain um and so i'm just i'm i'm very happy and and throughout this episode i just kept thinking about um uh this this movie um it's it, it's kind of obscure it's uh, it's called the fast and the furious and there's a yeah. character in it named dominic <laughs> toretto and he says mm -hmm. i don't have i don't have friends i have family family, family. <laughs> okay yeah. all right we're gonna jump franchise look look check table bringing all the franchises mm -hmm. to the table <laughs> to these conversations i love it um i yeah the last thing i'd echo around book is just the really powerful moment in space doc when he and saru were talking about rage like exactly what you're talking about maya mama like for book to i think what i'm also appreciating is book is finding community among multiple beings on the ship it's not just his girlfriend burnham right but it's his friend colber it's his friend stam it's his, his friend saru so i just I, I appreciate all that all right uh last topic in this chunky chunky thematics um this is our unprepped holiday e episode but we're like talking like we've been prepped and ready so <laughs> i know Love, love, love to this table. All right, final topic, uh, Gray, right? We finally get to see Gray in this corporeal uh, realness. Uh, he, they've been practicing their finger exercises. Here we get to see them talking 
to Adira. Um, Claudia earlier said they were playing chess. I think they were actually playing this Trill Guardian um, training game. That's the chess-like oh. game that we're seeing. Um, it's actually like a learning game, I guess. Um, and so I just wanted to connect in these moments. Like th I love that Grace says, I'm training to be a guardian and we're all about the intersection of spiritual and scientific. So it feels like we're gonna keep getting some of the science and spirit stuff mixed up, um, exploring in this um, episode. And I guess just the last thing is to say, I don't know, did anybody else's face drop when Zora like straight up named and claimed, I am a sentient organism living inside of a supercomputer. <laughs> Like, so there's just yeah. a lot, of, there's a lot in that journey. So Maya, I'm going to come to you first. Um, your thoughts on Gray's uh, journey in this moment. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, Gray is still uh, assimilating into a new body. And so it looks like um, he is using some of that skill to try to help Zora um, and, and recognizes that, that all of that, that, that she's, paying attention to so many systems and things happening inside, even when she can't um, predict, you know, tell what's happening on the outside. Um, yeah. And, and then Gray just asking, you know, and Gray just asking, is that normal that you can't feel anything that you it seems like you're numb, you know? And, and, and again, like we're just getting that um, personification that uh, realizing, yeah, that, Zora is is real is not just a, a computer um I also thought it was interesting that um Gray is not commissioned is not doesn't have a specific role on the ship and I was sort of thinking of what I remember of, of the next generation I, I just remember there being a lot of people on that ship so I thought that that there were other people on different ships that that maybe I don't know that didn't always have a role so um, so I, I was just thinking about that. Are there other people that are, you know, unless they are diplomats or, you know, doing something specific, um, or there for a temporary amount of time. Um, and then one last thing, the, the, the resting routing system mess hall joke, I didn't get it, but, um, but I thought it was interesting that Zora is learning like how to decipher what a joke is. Where she says that, uh, that, uh, like life systems have come back in this one mess hall. And then Gray's like, is that a joke? And she's like, did you laugh? Then it was a joke. That's what you're talking about, right? <laughs> right, right, right. That's what I meant. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Maya, for opening um, opening that up. Claudia, other thoughts about Gray? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. Trills have always been a metaphor. They've always been a metaphor. They've always been a way for Star Trek to slip in some LGBTQ, uh, trans uh, kind of ideas, present storyline under the radar of some incredibly heterosexist showrunners that would not let it in. Like there was a 20 year chokehold on the franchise where all the people inside of it were like, hi, we'd like to reflect this normal piece of humanity. It's weird. We're telling a story in the future and we're not. What I like about this is that um, uh, I'm still getting the metaphors. I'm still getting the metaphors really hard. Like the idea of being a consciousness inside of a supercomputer, the the ways that um, um, being a consciousness that has gone into an Android body and has to figure itself out again. Like what is my relationship to my vessel now that my vessel has changed? Um, I still feel like the metaphors are real, even as I'm deeply grateful that it's not just a metaphor. That Gray is actually from the trans community. So like Gray, Gray is coming from a couple of different perspectives, I feel like. Gray is giving advice not only as like from Trill and that experience, not only from being like an, an android, but also um, um, from their own experience of gender, which is, they're, they're, they're kind of perfect, actually, to give, to give a supercomputer therapy. <laughs> I love it. Yes, yes. All right. And last but not least, Maya Mama, your final thoughts on this topic. Um, I think it can be really scary to see how the Federation is going to treat a new life form because sometimes they mess it up. Mm. And uh, but you know, well, we all know that Burnham herself has four mothers, and so I just really feel like she can't mess mm -hmm. this up. Mm -hmm. Um and um and and i think that that's that's it's just really lovely um she treats her like a person and which can be difficult because her body is 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 the ship 
Her body's mm-hmm. the ship. It's not that she doesn't have a body. Like she, she's the ship. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and it did remind me of Moya, uh, mm-hmm. from Farscape. Moya also had a pilot that was, that had to hook in, um, mm-hmm. to, to, to fly and go into the systems. And, um, mm-hmm. and I just, I, I, I just like that. I think that's neat. Mm-hmm. And I know there's so many more ways that we could discuss this episode, so many things that we could talk about as we look at how Stamets and Colbert are trying to use the science of books experiences. Um, Yeah, all these things with um, Gray and Zora and some of these questions um, that we are raising. I'm I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm excited that um, as the season continues, we're at episode um, six, which means we only have five more episodes this season. So I just want to prep us. We're in the middle of this season right now. We're in the middle of this season. I see Claudia's face. Um, yeah. I think you're making a face out of disappointment. That's how I'm reading it. I, <laughs> I want more episodes. Yes, I know. But for now, this was thematics uh, for season four, episode six, Stormy Weather. And now we are heading into our final Trek table question. Trek table question number three. Who are you? Af- who were you afraid would die in this episode? <laughs> Welcome back. We are answering and responding to Trek Table question number three. Who were you most concerned about kicking it this episode? Because it was full of danger. It was full of drama and suspense. And I'm going to answer first because y'all, I'm a sucker for Star Trek. I'm a Star Trek dummy. I mean, what is up with me thinking that that she is going to die? She's the lead. Uh, She's the lead. Like Michael wasn't going to die. I totally thought Michael was going to die. I was like... Is Michael gonna die, and then they're gonna be in the future, and Aldous Hodge will be captain? What's happening? But um, she didn't die. Spoiler alert: she didn't die, and, and but I was concerned. <laughs> um, 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 Dela, how about you? Who were you concerned about? Um, I may not be the only one on this, but I thought Dr. Pollard, I was worried Dr. Pollard was gonna die when they said she was near that section. I was like, don't do it, you guys, don't do it. Don't do it. It I was not done. I talked out loud to the TV. I was mad. Mm-hmm. I was like, you mm-hmm. better not. You better not kill my mm-hmm. Dr. Pollard. Mm-hmm. I got like mm-hmm. deep throated in my chest. I was mad mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Maya, who are you con- uh, concerned about um, possibly um, getting killed in this episode? Well, I was just worried about the ship. And I don't know how much that ship can take and be rebuilt and all of that. So just the ship and then i don't know how that works with zora too totally like when she was saying pieces of me are dying i was really concerned too like maybe when when they came out of it she wasn't going to be awake anymore and that would have been i would have been real sad about that because i'm slowly falling in love with zora uh maya Mm -hmm. mama were you another dr pollard concerned person i was i was very concerned i thought it was going to be dr pollard but then i saw a random other crew member and then i felt really sad for him yeah. <laughs> and some cortez yeah. honors oh, some cortez it's- Vincent Cortez, you know, at least, at least we have a different relationship to the red shirts. They don't necessarily always have a shirt that's red. And Mm -hmm. um, when they are killed to make the plot as dangerous and scary as possible, everybody feels bad about it. Like the entire Mm -hmm. ship was like, Cortez, aw. I like those Mm -hmm. shipmates. Good for them. Well, that was Trek Table question number three, and that brings us to a close for all of our Trek Table questions for this Trek Table episode number 38. And that was a little bit of Fancy Time Teller by the band Quetzal off of their album, Die Cowboy Die. And um, I just, the lo- I love the title of the album. Of the album. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that is our new theme song for our wacky new segment. Sometimes it's filled with Easter eggs. Sometimes it's just wacky little things that Trek fans like us might find or have noticed. And we think it's fun. This is our new uh, 
segment called Star Trek Shenanigans. So we're going to go around really quick since this is an unprepped episode, holidays version. Each of us is going to share a shenanigan that we saw in this week's episode. Um, it seems like I've been doing this all episode, so I'm going to come back to you first, Maya Mama. Uh, your shenanigan this episode. My shenanigan is that Saru was talking about the Enterprise and the Voyage and uh, Voyager, and I was just like, oh, ooh. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was very short. It 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 was just it just gave me a little fan mm -hmm. fan fan excitements. Mm -hmm. Loved it. I'll go next. Um, my big ooh was I love that the crew was able to hide in the pattern buffers. I feel like I love, I was like, Jordy LaForge always talking about the pattern buffers. The pattern buffers are we going to see inside the pattern buffers. And it felt also a little bit like that gal Galaxy Quest moment when Justin Long and the kids in the chompers and they're trying to like guide them through the bellies of the ship. So um, yeah, that was my shenanigans. Maya, what about you? What's, what's your shenanigan this episode? Just that moment when Stamets says, jumping carries unknown risks, Captain. To me, it felt very Scotty, even though it didn't have a Scottish accent. <laughs> like, kinda, I'm not going to do it. I did it. I'm sorry. We can imagine. <laughs> we want to we wanna listen, we wanna listen for that on the rewatch. I love it. Um, thank you. Maya Mama, your, oh no, sorry. Uh, Claudia, your uh, shenanigan this episode. Well, first of all, Daylon, your shenanigan was literally an episode of the Next Generation. Like, like Scotty, that's how Scotty was a guest on the Next Generation. He was in a pattern buffer for like seventy-five years, according to Minda. Minda gave me that seventy-five years. So, like, it was an entire thing. Okay. Um, but I want to talk about Stamets saying there are no wires. Wires? That's amazing. That in mm -hmm. the future there are no wires. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no wires in space. No wire hangers. No That's wire hangers. No wire. Uh, no wire hangers. No wire hangers. All right. Well, so they must get uh, the computer to do all of their dry cleaning. I don't know. And that is that how you clean those uniforms? That's what I wonder. I don't know. It's all, all right. programmable matter, baby. Ooh, all right. And so those were just some of our insights for Star Trek shenanigans for season four, episode six, Stormy Weather. And don't forget that you can join us next Sunday, January 2nd, for our next live and final Trek Table Holidays Unprepped Edition when we unpack Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 7, But to Connect, which will start streaming on Paramount Plus on Thursday, 12-30-21. Here at the Trek Table, we strive to hold space for Black, Indigenous, Brown, women of color, and our allies. Uh, here are some resources that amplify and highlight the work of our allies, um, ally white women who are content creators, community builders, or world shapers. If you are looking for more women-centered convos with a Star Trek frame, we invite you to look at or join Justine Mastin and Larissa A. Garski as they talk all things pop culture, fandom, and psychology. These co-conspirators are licensed marriage and family therapists, writers, and full-time Starfleet officers. Together, they boldly go into therapy. They use fandom to make psychology theory and self-understanding accessible. So super nerdy and super educational. Check the links or find them at Starship Therapies on Apple Podcasts. Yes, yes. And if you have a woman of color content creator or someone that you would like us to amplify, maybe an ally, please send us some information and help us uh, amplify them to our audience. And that was our signal boost for Trek Table episode number 38. All right, we want to welcome you all uh, back. Thank you so much for joining us for this special episode of Truck Table number 38. Um, as is the case with uh, each show each week, even though it's a holidays episode, we want to give you our final thoughts. I'm going to invite the panel to go around. We're going to give our final thoughts for this Star Trek Discovery, season four, episode six, Stormy Weather. Uh, Maya Mama, as is the case today, I'm going to come to you first. Can I invite you to share your final thoughts? Um, I just, I really thought that this was a really perfect uh, episode for. I guess for the holidays, um, we, uh, you know, it's about togetherness and family and, and finding your place and being home uh, and getting home. 
and uh and i just i i really enjoyed it i thought it was uh just a really a really lovely time um and uh that tree though mm-hmm. so. <laughs> yes yes thank you and because the maya name is a great name we're gonna have maya go next nice. um yes so just you know yeah i love the I thought of multiple things when they said they were hitting the edges. And I think about that as, as sometimes we got to hit our edges, you know, to kind of see where, where our actual limits sometimes need to be pushed. Um, but also the idea of playing games or being relaxing in a lounge all day as a passenger and, and that, and that actually helping you clear your head um, to, to find, you know, new information that kind of, I, the, 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 the conversations not only with Zora and Gray, but also Book for me were really about like these these messages of 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 thinking about how to, you know, deal with uncomfortable and, and difficult times and 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 finding ways to focus when there's so much unknown. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Claudia, your final thoughts for this episode. Uh, the title, Stormy Weather, it's so evocative. Like the 1943 Lena Horne film, that was a war movie. Like that was a movie that was made for the soldiers, you know, mm-hmm. to, to, to like to help them uh, um, do some emotional processing so they can keep the battle going. And I feel like that's what Star Trek Discovery is doing for all of us. It's like, yeah, you are surviving the war that is living through this global pandemic, that is living through all of this racial um, um, strife and racism. Um, and I just, I, I love that this is a, that this is a show that feels like it's, um, it's, it's equipping me for all the battles that I'm going to need to do for the rest of the year. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. So my final thought is this. Uh, I love that this episode we get to see the through line and at least uh, understanding that Zora comes into consciousness with the disco crew that we know and love. When I first saw that short trek with Aldous Hodges, I wasn't sure that we were going to know this computer, know this Zora. And I want to acknowledge that we heard her say where her name comes from. It comes from Earth cultures, Baku cultures, Navarre cultures, and her name means, you know, dawn or new day. And I just, I think it is an interesting question because I feel like even with all the technology that we have, we as humans are still in this rift. We are still in this rift of space. And if we don't talk to each other and if we don't learn from old technology or learn from human culture connection or creature culture connection as we widen our understanding to, you know, the sentient beings living inside of these machines, as well as species that we haven't met yet. Um, I just feel like, yeah, this is this is why I love Star Trek. This is this is what I've, I've been waiting for. So. Um, super excited about this episode. And I guess the last thing that I want to say is um, I'm just really struck by Saru, not only Saru's advice, but Burnham's advice. So I want to say these last few things. Uh, I love that we get to hear Saru remind us that greater focus brings greater awareness. And I love that Burnham says that I make decisions by trying to use the fear to tell myself so that I will be stronger. And I agree, Claudia, this is uh, survival guides right now. So I just want to say thanks so much again to this team of amazing artists, creators, and collaborators who brought us another amazing Discovery episode. And those are our final thoughts for Star Trek Discovery, season four, episode six, Stormy Weather. We hope you'll join us on Sunday, January 2nd, when we talk, talk about season four, episode seven of Star Trek Discovery, but to connect, which premieres on Thursday, December 30th. Catch this and all episodes of Star Trek Discovery on Paramount+. Plus. All right, and we want to say thank you all so much for joining us at the Trek Table. You're going to get first look at Trek Table questions, inside scoops, and more when you sign up for our mailing list at trektable.com. 
And you can find recordings of Trek Table Podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're as happy as we are that Trek Table is holding space for Discovery and other Trek fans, then we invite you to share that joy with us and become a supporter at patreon.com slash trektable. One-time donation or monthly. One dollar, five dollar, ten dollars, just to keep this work going. Like and subscribe to us on Instagram at Trek Table and on Twitter at Trek underscore table. Yes, yes. And I'd love to say thank you to this table assembled. Thank you for coming together in this holiday week, taking some time in your schedule so that we could debrief this episode. So many things to talk about. I want to say thank you so much, Claudia Alec, Maya Chinchilla, and Maya Mills Lowe. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your insights uh, and reflections with us today. And of course, we also want to say a big thank you, salamat, gracias to uh, the band Quetzal for all the music that we get to hear today as well. Today we were holding Trek space for all the feelings that are in space and folks that are feeling different is good and special. We're holding space for family and drama and the trauma that comes with it. We're holding space for people coming together in all the ways we can with vaccines and masks and boosters. And of course, we're holding Trek space for celebration. The Trek Table is produced by Allison De La Cruz and Luz Munjarwala. Production coordinator is Brandon Chang. Stream manager, Ariana Michelle. Social media manager, Isil Barlasa. And our social media associate is Jimena Martinez. Deep gratitude and thanks to Outside In Theater, with extra thanks to Paul, Matt, Jessica, Danny, and Tamlin. Thanks to Deborah Carter, Doc Zulu, and Nancy Yap, and our partners at Visual Communications. We also want to say special thanks to our content partners at Calling Up Justice. Trek Table is a service mark of De La Projects, LLC. Yes, and we want to say thank you so much for joining us at the Trek Table today. Let's go ahead and close this ritual by taking one more closing breath. Let's go ahead and take a breath in. And out. And one last time, we hope that you'll join us on Sunday, January 2nd, as we dive into But to Connect, the season four, episode seven of Star Trek Discovery with our guest, Rose Portillo. Trek table is going to reassemble then. We hope we will be holding Trek space for you till then. Have a great week and a great set of holidays. Just get